Good morning, Dunbar Heights. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Hi, my name is Dave Little, and I am the candidate for the role of associate pastor with a focus on youth and young adults. Now, I've met a few of you in the town hall on Wednesday, and it was great to meet you, and I look forward to meeting many more of you. Now, you don't know me well, and by way of introduction, I thought I'd uh, share a little bit of a snapshot of my life as a young person. Uh, And it kind of illustrates our need for this passage that we're talking about today. Now, keep in mind, I didn't become a Christian until I was in my mid-20s. Now, I kind of went to a youth group and a little bit of church when I was a kid and a teen, But honestly, I didn't really get this whole Jesus thing. And I don't actually think anyone really told me the gospel, or I wasn't listening. That's also quite possible. Now, the snapshot I want you to see is uh, me in my 20s. I was at UBC, and I lived actually not far from here in the Dunbar neighborhood. So what was I like? From the outside, I looked pretty decent. Well, I didn't want to say really good because that's kind of prideful, but like I looked pretty decent. At uh, some point, I may or may not have dyed my hair blonde, but that's another story. Now, here I am. I'm going to school. I had this really fun job. I worked at this after-school care where I got paid to play with Lego and eat snacks. Pretty good deal. I had this really cool group of friends, and I was uh, was pretty fit. I was pretty fit, you know, go to the gym and all that kind of thing. I went skiing at Whistler, and I even actually worked at Grouse Mountain for a while. Uh, I like to windsurf. That was a thing back in the day. It's like kite surfing, but the kite is on the board. Yeah, it was really cool, right? That's the outside. That's what you looked at when you looked in. But on the inside, I was a mess. I was so anxious about everything, particularly about school. I would even actually get panic attacks. Remember that cool group of friends I told you about? Well, they were kind of more like a high school Netflix show. You know the one with all the drama? There was just so much drama. <laughs> and actually, I got canceled from that group of friends, just like a show would get canceled. I, I, I had these friends who said, you're no longer our friends. I got canceled from that group. And my body, well, it felt under so much stress that I actually ended up going to the hospital with chest pains which, by the way, turned out to be a little bit of asthma from secondhand cigarette smoke. Yeah, yeah, I know, drama. Okay, so here I am. I'm miserable. I'm lonely. I'm anxious and fearful, maybe depressed, very dark place, and very, very lost. Now, this snapshot of my life is my life without Jesus. It's my life without peace. Now, spoiler alert, uh, Jesus saved me, or I wouldn't be standing here before you. But before I knew Jesus, I knew no peace. Now, today's passage in Matthew 5, 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, there's a whole lot going on here, and Jesus is teaching some key things to us and to all of his disciples. Now let's put this passage in its context. Let me read to us Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through our first verse 9. Seeing the crowds, he, Jesus, went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We're going to look at our passage in three sections. Pictures of peace people of peace, and practicing peace. 
First of all, pictures of peace. We're going to look at two pictures. One is peace in the world and of the world. And the second is peace and how does God define it. So peace, what is it? Well, if we take this kind of picture of, of peace without God in the equation, this is kind of what the dictionary says. It's a state of tranquility and rest, this ending of hostilities, and it's in the world and in relationship and personal. So peace in the world, right? Ending of hostilities, peace between nations or security in a city or, or peace between groups. That kind of makes sense. Maybe you're thinking, hmm, peacekeepers, right? Peacekeepers. Those are usually soldiers sent into an area to provide a deterrent for hostilities in a region. And although this can sometimes be effective to produce absence of war, it tends to be only a temporary solution. And there are numerous examples of this in uh, history and even right now all around the world. How about relational peace? Peace in families and friends and so on. Now, I'm not sure how you're feeling about this one right now during this pandemic, but peace in the home or the workplace or school, right? And I'm not sure if I even need to talk about this, that this is actually a good thing. Peace in this area, ending of hostilities in this is a good thing. But is it actually really peace? Is this worldly peace really peace? Maybe we want to just keep the peace. Maybe we don't want to say anything to stir anything up. If we say anything wrong, maybe we might even get canceled, create conflict, ruin that peace. It doesn't seem to be a real peace. It's just kind of a tentative peace. And how about internal or personal peace, right? Again, with this pandemic, most of us are just trying to get through this. You got masks and super spreading and fears and there's older or vulnerable people in our lives, isn't it just overwhelming? It puts us on the edge. And many of us are hiding in our homes, as we're kind of told we're supposed to do. So maybe we have this temporary peace, this temporary internal peace with our little world, a partial peace. But it doesn't seem to be quite enough, does it? even if we're good at our mindful practices and all those kinds of things. So this first picture of worldly peace, it's the world all around us. We get this maybe partial peace, but it's lacking in real rest, real peace. Maybe even it's a pretend peace, kind of like what my hair is doing right now. It's kind of pretending to stay in order, but it's kind of a COVID hairstyle right now, and I've just kind of get, got the product in there just to keep it down. How about, how about this second picture of peace? This is a peace that God speaks about. What does God have to say about peace? Now, as it turns out, quite a lot, and so much so that we might find hundreds of passages in the Old and New Testament on peace. Now, don't worry, we're not going to look at them all because I kind of want you to like me at the end of this. Now, Jesus actually acknowledges the difference between a worldly way and the peace that he brings. Listen to this in John chapter 14. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. There's a very big difference between what the world gives, which Jesus actually says is trouble, not real peace, and the peace that he gives. And in order to kind of understand what our passage says about blessed are the peacemakers, we're going to look at two passages, one in the Old Testament and one in the New now, the passage in the Old Testament is from Isaiah. Now, Isaiah, you may know quite well, he speaks of a Messiah to come as actually the Prince of Peace. And he talks about a suffering servant who brought us peace by his suffering. In Isaiah chapter 26, verses 3 and 4, we have a really good passage on peace. Let me read it to us. He's talking to God. 
You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock. Now, the word that Isaiah uses for peace here and throughout all the Hebrew Bible, and in, this is the Old Testament, is the word shalom. Now, it can be as simple as a greeting that you could probably say to your Jewish friends, shalom, which kind of means hello, right? But it means so much more than that. This word shalom for peace is completeness, soundness, safety, well-being in every direction, every relation. Here in Isaiah and all over the Bible, God is the one who keeps us in peace and brings us perfect peace in every direction. Peace comes from trusting in the Lord who is fully reliable and sound and solid and eternal, not temporary or partial, but perfect. Now, this deep meaning of peace is picked up in the New Testament directly about, surprise, Jesus. We could go to a lot of places, but I thought we could go to Colossians chapter 1 to hear about what this peace is. And this is speaking about Jesus. Verse 19 says, For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. We could just sit on that verse. How good is that? All the fullness of God is pleased to dwell in Jesus. And verse 20, And through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Just as in the Old Testament, perfect peace comes from God, wholeness and life and rest. Here in the New Testament, the idea of rest and moving from being separated to oneness, being separated to oneness. Just notice how connected peace is with the cross of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of all our sins, our peace with God is by the sacrifice of the blood of Jesus. And notice also that this word reconcile, which is bringing together this broken relationship, this word reconcile is interconnected with peace. Jesus reconciles all things, the full circle, the wholeness of everything in our lives. He reconciles all things to God. In another passage, there's a very similar idea to this in Ephesians, where it says that He Himself, Jesus, is our peace. So, perfect peace comes from God. And as our Beatitude says, we actually get to participate in this peace actively. How is this possible? To participate in eternal peace? We don't look a whole lot like God. How can we bring this peace? So our next section is actually, who do you look like? Who do you look like? Our passage, blessed are the peacemakers, says that you and I are people of peace. So who do you look like? Well, when we receive forgiveness, reconciliation, and participate in this perfect peace of Jesus, we bear the family likeness. We belong to God's family. That's what our beatitude tells us. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So let's pause here for a second. And this is especially for our young people. This is one of those big questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? It's so important for us to ask this question. And doesn't it kind of feel like we're always trying to figure this out? So what group do I belong to? Am I sporty or nerdy or artsy or rebellious or am I studious or am I unique or am I kind of the same? 
are these my friends, my team, my tribe? It's really hard. And if you're not yet a Christian, there are way too many answers to all these questions. Who am I? Where do I belong? But the basic answer is if you're not yet a Christian, is this, you belong to the world, to the ways of the world, to the limitations of the world, to the darkness and even the judgment of this world. And you could probably even feel some of that darkness sometimes of the world, can't you? But if you have said yes to Jesus and trust that He is your peace, your salvation spent for you on the cross, who do you belong to? Our beatitude says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Sons, daughters, children, the family of God. You and I are people of peace. Now, before we leave this stunning declaration, well, why is this so good? If you just think for a second, the darkness of this world, all the guilt and the shame and the fears and the anxieties, the identity crises, the injustices of this world, all of them, and I mean all of them, find their peace in Jesus. All of them. When you belong to God, you have the way of peace for your own soul, and for this world. So, the big question as we look to our final point is, how do we participate in this Jesus peace? How do we make peace? How can we actively bring this shalom, this wholeness and completeness, soundness and security and healthiness? How can we live into bringing this peace like Jesus, this reconciliation, this forgiveness in relationships with God and with others, and even in ourselves and all around the world? How do we do this? Now, if you're thinking, I don't really do this, or I don't do this well. In fact, I'm not even sure if these Beatitudes, I do any of them very well. Well, hear this. You've heard some really good things before this, but I want you to hear this too. Jesus does not declare these beatitudes over you to shame you. Jesus does not declare these beatitudes over you to shame you, to give you guilt. No. Like we've talked about, we are speaking about the work of God Himself through Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not, hey, Dave, manufacture some inner peace, inner peace, right? And then come up with some sort of peace on demand. No. If Christ himself is our peace, then the work of peacemaking is all about him. If he is the perfect peacemaker, you and I make him known. We make peace known as we make him known, we make peace known. So Jesus, declaring this blessing over us, we are called to be like him, the Son of God. And so as sons and daughters, family, we apply his peace, share his peace, live out his peace, that we make peace wherever we are. Now, this sounds great in a sermon, doesn't it? But come Monday morning, some of you are thinking, mm, oh, this is very well and good, but aren't you just a little bit too idealistic, optimistic, naive? I just wanted to say that word, naive. I want to acknowledge that this piece of Jesus cost him everything. So it definitely has a cost. And Jesus knew it when he discovered declares this blessing are over us, this blessed are the peacemakers over us. He knows the cost. In fact, the very next beatitude, blessed are those who are persecuted, is very clear on this, isn't it? More on that next time. So this is where I'd like to pause for a second. 
what might be some of your objections to being the peacemaker Jesus is calling you to be? Now, if we were in youth group or a discussion time, here's what we probably could talk about. Here's a couple of objections that I think might come up. Here's one. I'm not really feeling this peace you're talking about. Maybe I'm not Christian enough or good enough or some sort of super Christian. By the way, there's no such thing as a super Christian. Blessed are the poor in spirit, P.S. But here's what it is. The peace of Christ isn't about an emotional feeling. This peace is achieved by Jesus' action on the cross. Jesus is enough. And he declares you to be that as a disciple, you are his peacemakers, sent by him. Now, maybe that doesn't give you a ton of confidence, but it simplifies things, doesn't it? You don't have to feel it to be a peacemaker. Now, it's, it's amazing when you do experience that peace of God, and that is so good. And I pray that you do experience that peace of God. Now, another objection might be this. No one really wants this peace that you're talking about, this Jesus peace. So it's not going to really work. It's kind of a waste of my time. Any little peace I try to bring is going to actually hit a wall, or it's just going to kind of dissipate. Now, this objection kind of has a ring of truth to it, doesn't it? Maybe you've experienced it. But if we look and we listen, the world is so full of hate, of fear, of scattered and estranged people, maybe electronically connected, but desperately lonely. I certainly was before I met Jesus. Don't you agree at least that this world needs real peace? How about this objection? I'm too young or inexperienced. And for many of us, it feels like that quite a bit of the time. But Jesus is declaring this blessing over you too. Maybe even more so. He loves to take the young and inexperienced, those who are humble enough to say, I I can't really do this, poor in spirit, like so many prophets, like David, like the first disciples, even the woman at the well. He likes to take this little bit of faithfulness and multiply it just like a mustard seed. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, I want to acknowledge that these objections are kind of real. And you and I can can resonate with these objections. But again, listen to Jesus. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Church, we can practice peace. So, as we go out this week, I want to encourage you to make peace, to make peace. Now, here's two ways, basically, that we can do that. One is relational peace, that's what I'm to call it. And the other one I'm going to call missional peace. So, the first, this relationship peace. Well, how do we bring the peace of Jesus to relationships? How do we bring peace to hostilities and conflict? How do we bring forgiveness and reconciliation and and safety and friendship? How can we bring those things? Let me just ask a series of questions for us. Maybe just to encourage you to think about it. What might it look like for you to bring the forgiveness of Jesus into your family? Or maybe even ask forgiveness and to do this consistently. What might it look like? for you to bring that forgiveness? What might it look like to bring peace and reconciliation at work? Can you be the one to make that effort? It can be so much easier just to let things slide, but can you get into that mess? What would it look like? What might it look like for you to be the safe person at school? putting away your own needs to listen, to care for, and even play with other kids? 
What might it look like for you to be a true friend? A friend like Jesus who laid down his life for us. In this pandemic, so many people are isolated. We're busy and overwhelmed and just trying to keep our bubble safe. And peace is costly. Who might God be calling you to extend his peace and friendship and invitation? Now, that's just a few ideas, and there's so many more I'm sure you could come up with. Now, the second area of bringing peace, I'm going to call practicing missional peace, or bringing the peace of the good news of Jesus. Now, this one might be a little bit more challenging, and you might kind of be holding back a little bit right now. This peace is the mission of Jesus, this kingdom message, the gospel, Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection and his promise of coming again as the righteous judge. The peace of forgiveness and reconciliation on the cross. Let me just mention a few areas which I think we can bring this missional peace to. The first area is actually you yourself. We can bring this peace to ourselves, Because in order to be peacemakers, to practice the peace of Christ, we need to know it. The person who practices peace needs to be growing in that peace too. We need to receive that peace ourselves by the work of the Holy Spirit. Are you reading your Bible, listening to the peace of Christ? Are you praying, praying for that peace in your life and the life of others? Are you worshiping, praying to God who brings you the peace and praising Him? You yourself need that peace. Also, the church. The church needs this missional peace. Basically, other Christians need you to be peacemakers. How are you practicing peace with the church of Jesus? Who can you be encouraging with the love and forgiveness and reconciliation of Jesus? Maybe it's just a text. Hey, I miss seeing you at youth group or at church or at Sunday school. Or I just basically miss seeing you because I don't see anybody. Maybe it's you send a little Bible passage or something that encouraged you in your faith. Maybe there's a conflict that needs the peace of Jesus, even in the church, even with Christians. In fact, we might hide it a little more because we don't want to be those who are in conflict. But who might God be sending you to, to bring the peace of Christ? So pray for the courage to come and expose that conflict and bring the gospel peace to Christians. And the third one I'm going to mention is probably the hardest, probably the one we don't want to do, but we know we have to, and it's bring the missional peace of Christ to the world. And this might seem a little scary, to bring Jesus to the world, practice peace in the world, to talk about Jesus, maybe people will think I'm weird, or for sure they'll think I'm weird, right? Or irrelevant, this is old-timey stuff, right? No one pays attention to that anymore. Or maybe even, I'm the villain. I'm the bad guy or gal. But here's the thing. Right now, maybe more than ever, this world is worn out, fearful, chaotic, but searching. Constantly searching. And here's what I would say to at least start this missional peace in the world. As you love, serve and help people. And I'm assuming you do. As a Christian, at least you're doing some of that. As you do that in the lives of people who don't know Jesus, maybe any area of your life, maybe it's a team, maybe it's school, maybe it's in your neighborhood, wherever it is, the call is to listen to Jesus in his word and ask, what is Jesus calling me to do? How am I to love this person. Sometimes, yes, it means actually being quiet and listening and just being with that person, maybe weeping with that person, maybe 
being angry with that person about some injustice. And sometimes, maybe more often than we would like, it means being courageous and speaking about Jesus, bringing Jesus into that conversation. Because He Himself is our peace. This world needs Jesus, the only perfect peacemaker. So, fellow peacemakers, friends, brothers and sisters, as we wrap up, you are blessed. You get to resonate with the very heart of God in this. You are a Christian family, sons and daughters of God. You are peacemakers as you experience the peace and forgiveness and reconciliation of Jesus and make that peace known. Make Him known. You get to be ambassadors for Christ. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now let me just read this beautiful blessing over us as we finish. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Dave, thanks so much for that really encouraging word this morning. Um, love that thought of that we who have received the peace of Christ are now to be his peacemakers in this world. Uh, but what an encouragement as well as a call to each of us uh, that we all need to think about how to do that. So thank you for encouraging us that way this morning. Uh, I want to give us two quick reminders uh, as we head out to our closing song here this morning. First of all, as I remind us always, please continue to be faithful in your prayer and in your giving. Uh, these are not only about supporting and building up and growing our own faith. They're also about supporting the ministries of this church as we seek to serve uh, out of this place to the needs uh, of those around us through prayer and through the different ministries uh, that we are involved in supporting. So please continue to be faithful in those things. Secondly, if you are a member... Um, you should have received a second email with uh, the mail out of this online service this morning uh, that has a link that will take you to uh, an online survey where we'll do our online voting today. We are deciding today as a membership whether or not we will take on Dave as our associate pastor in this, this youth and young adults role. So I would ask you to just please take those uh, two minutes right now. It's not a long survey at all. Take the time to quickly just go and fill that out right now. As I mentioned, we do need a 75% majority of members uh, to vote uh, in favor uh, in order to actually call someone in the pastoral role. So we need as many of you as possible to come out and give your vote uh, so we can know just where we stand and how we move ahead with that. Uh, so thank you for your attention to that. Please not just uh, putting that off till a couple days from now. Uh, we'd love to uh, know where we stand in the next day or so. So if you could do that today, that would be a great help to us. Uh, thank you. Um, God bless you. Um, go now in the grace and the peace of Christ.